right, calling the meeting to order. Um, first up, we're just going to do quick introductions. I'm Scott Osterholm. Catherine Hitchcock. Nick Cunningham. Kenny Alton. Wendy Rickshoff. I'm Chief Dave Hale. And Chrissy Cruz, Treasurer. Awesome. All right. Today's meeting is a little different because we have a special topic. Um, we're going to be talking about women's safety and how the criminal justice system works with, uh, with Chief Hale. And we have um, Wendy Hoff Hicks, the Director of Assistance Program, City of Dayton, Xenia Law Department. Yeah. Um, what I've sort of tried to do is just give you an overview of um, the Ohio Revised Code. The Ohio Revised Code is what police departments, governmental agencies all sort of run by. Uh, I realize the PowerPoint's a little squished in there, there but it, it serves my purpose because if you can read that, what it actually says is that these are the laws and rules controlling government, counties, townships, municipal corporations, agriculture, financial institutions, uh, down to the bottom of our water supply, sanitation, ditches, uh, workforce development. Um, it covers pretty much the rules for government. In addition to the revised code, there is an administrative code. And, and these are the rules and things that control everything. If you can see it on there, uh, municipal courts, mayor's courts, uh, probate juvenile courts, etc. Um, from the law enforcement standpoint, predominantly what we deal with are a couple sections of that revised code. Uh, the, the crime section is chapter 29, and then you have a couple traffic sections that we deal with, which I'm not really going to get into. And when you look at the crime sections, um, they sort of break down into the administrative end of things, which is the forfeiture, sentencing, pardon, parole, extradition, probation, appeals, sexual predators, and how they're tracked, uh, sentencing, um, trials, arraignment, and the, the court end of things. And then the first part of it is, is the actual the crimes. Um, those crimes tend to break down in, into two different sections. Um, although it's not a hard and fast rule, what you predominantly have is crimes that involve a true victim and crimes that do not involve the victim, or the victim is the state of Ohio. Uh, your victim crimes pretty much are homicide and assault, kidnapping and extortion, uh, sexual offenses, arson and the related offenses, robbery, burglary, trespassing, safe cracking, theft and fraud, and offenses against the family. Arson um, and related offenses includes things like vandalism, criminal damaging, the sex crime include all sexual offenses against children and uh, uh, prostitution. The offenses against the family is domestic violence, uh, violation of protection orders, and endangering children. Um, with the exception of homicide and domestic violence, you almost always have to have a victim to move forward with one of these crimes. So in, in other words, if uh, somebody breaks out the window to your car and you call the police and we come out and we take a report and we find that it was the neighbor kid and you said, look, we don't want to prosecute it. We're no longer willing to move with prosecution of this. The prosecution is dead. You know, I think sometimes people believe that if you involve the cops, that what we want to do is, is get the people in front of the courts and get them there. When there is a victim crime, you're the victim, we're the vehicle to get that crime in front of the courts. So that's really our purpose. Um, you know, there are cases where, again, you, you don't know who broke your window, and so you're, um, you know, you want it investigated. During the investigation, we find out that, you know, it's a 13-year-old, and, and you don't want to get involved, and you don't want that kid in the other juvenile court of the headaches that come with that. You're the victim. If you refuse to prosecute and cooperate the prosecution, the case is dead. So, um, you know, getting the police involved does not always mean that someone is going to go to jail, that this case is going to go to court, or that you as a victim lose control over it. Um, 
one of the other things that you, you've got to remember is that when you are the victim, I can't take that case and push it forward for you. You're the person, you're the accuser, and the accused has the right to face his accuser in court. So you can tell me a lot of things. I cannot testify to those things in court. Okay? You have to be the person who comes up there. And if somebody witnesses it, they have to be the person to go on the stand and give that testimony. I cannot do that for them. Um, when you look at the victimless crimes, you're looking back more at uh, gambling, which, believe it or not, is a very, very long law because it includes the bingo laws. And there's a, a bunch of regulations on bingo. Uh, the offense is against the public peace, which includes everything from uh, rioting, disorderly conduct, inducing panic. Office uh, Offenses against uh, justice and public administration, which includes the bribery, intimidation, perjury, and things like tampering with evidence. Uh, conspiracy, attempt, and complicity, where it defines those terms, what, what an attempted homicide is, if you're uh, conspiring with somebody else to commit a homicide. It also includes weapon control and corrupt activities, so uh, your concealed carry laws in there. Uh, the drug offenses are pretty straightforward. That's usually possession, trafficking, and manufacturing of drugs. And the miscellaneous offenses, which is a unusual little section at the end, that includes everything from abuse of a corpse, tobacco violations, ethnic intimidation, and fair housing violations. So those things can sort of be moved forward with court without a true victim being there. The state of Ohio will become that victim. Um, and so we can move those forward in those cases, but we still have to have the people cooperate. They still have to testify. They still have to be witnesses. Um, when you call the police to let people know what happens, our dispatchers are going to need an attempt to get the most accurate information to allow the officers to make the best decision on how to approach that situation. Um, Take the example where someone's thrown a rock through a window. You saw the car, it screamed down the street, it was a red car, that's all you know. You're not really in any harm at this point. Um, the officer may choose to actually spend five or 10 minutes trying to find the red car before he comes and contacts you. If someone is still outside throwing rocks at your house, then we're going to get there right away. So the, the dispatchers will want to get the best information they can, and they're gonna ask you a series of questions. Um, we normally think of the who, what, when, where, and how. For police dispatchers, it's who, what, when, where, and what. The dispatchers really aren't that interested in how things occur. Okay, that's more for the officer on the scene to get there. They want to know who did it, what happened, how long ago, did it occur, where, where, where did it occur at, around the corner, at your house, etc. And do the people who have this have any weapons? What's the threat of harm do they have to society, to other individuals, or the police officers responding? Uh, this information is then relayed out to the police officers. Uh, they'll try to coordinate their response. And, and again, they may choose to go around the corner. They may choose to check the area before getting right with you. So just because they're not at your house, if you're not, it doesn't mean that we're not responding, we're not looking, sometimes it's better try to find that individual. Um, we had a case not that long ago, uh, made the news there, um, state patrol in Clinton County goes out on an auto crash, the car is gone, we know they've hit a fence, uh, and a good witness there said, hey, it was a gold in color van, I think this is the license plate. The license plate did come back to a van that was registered outside of Springfield, so that information got broadcast into Green Central, uh, one of our officers heard it over the radio, said, hey, if they're going back to Springfield, they're likely coming right up 68. He went stationary on 68. Sure enough, here comes a gold van. He gets behind it. It goes left to center. He pulls it over, has mud all over it, et cetera. Uh, it was a male driver. There was four kids in the car. Uh, he was intoxicated. Um, and so that's why that information is, is the best information we can get comes into play in trying to to make people safe and to catch people doing these illegal things. Um, to assist an officer locating the suspect, here's what the dispatcher is going to want to know. The name of the suspect, if you know it, 
any and all distinguishing characteristics, uh, male or female, short or tall, heavy or thin, racial appearance if it's known, whether the suspect is has a beard, bald, hair color, hairstyle. Sometimes you know if you if you if you uh, have a ponytail as opposed to you know having a mohawk, that's a very distinguishing characteristic. Uh, any clothing that individual may be wearing, if you're good enough down to shoes. Did the suspect leave on foot or in a vehicle, on a bicycle? Uh, what direction was he last seen traveling? And again, did that individual have a weapon? Um, you know, I realize sometimes the caller believes they're calling about something that they believe very minor, but we're going to treat everything as serious. Um, early on in my career, I got a phone call as working dispatch, and it was early on a Sunday morning, and I get a call, and they said, hey, there's a, uh, two or three guys and they're trying to help this drunk guy get in the in his van and they're in, here on Dixie and uh, he's not cooperating or something. Um, you might want to get someone out here. Well, instead of just going, yeah, okay, I'm sending crews, actually got the person who called, got the name, got a phone number, etc. That guy wasn't drunk. He was dead. They were actually throwing him out of the van. Um, it was because we ended up getting that witness that they were able to follow up and actually solve that homicide. So even though, you know, sometimes you're calling, the citizen's calling, and it seems like a very minor detail, we train our people to try to get pertinent information and treat every call as if it could be that serious. Because we never know when it is or when it isn't. So be patient with the dispatchers, they're, they're doing as they're told. Um, to assist the officer locating the suspect, the dispatcher will want to know, again, any distinguishing characteristics of the vehicle, make and model that vehicle, if you know it, license plate. They may want to know if it's an older vehicle or, or a newer vehicle, uh, the size, whether or not it's a subcompact, a sedan, van, pickup. Anything you can give us may help us. Uh, if you can imagine a scenario where they say, hey, they call, hey, well, the bank just got robbed. And the dispatcher says, okay, I'll send someone out and hangs off. It's not what anybody wants to do. That dispatcher wants as much information. If you say it's, it's a male and he's left in a blue car, and we pull up and we see two blue cars leaving in two directions, which one does that officer choose to stop? So the more information that individual can get, the better of a job, the more likely we're going to detain the right person. So um, the responsibilities of the responding officers. When an officer gets there, their first responsibility is to make the scene safe. Um, if you can imagine, you get a call and a guy possibly drowned in a pool, you get there, there's wires in the pool, that officer jumps into that pool to try to save that individual, you may have two people in the pool drown because it may be electrified. So the officer's first responsibility is to make that scene safe, then provide for emergency care. Um, imagine yourself at an auto crash. It's, it's one thing for me to get out and try to help this individual, but if I'm helping the individual and we both then get struck by a passing motorist, we've done no good. Um, but the officer should. Even if um, you take the bank robbery scenario again and you've got, we've just been robbed, one of the tellers has been shot. The officer's going to respond to that bank and sees the suspect leaving. That officer is going to try to get a plate in that vehicle and go to the bank because our responsibility is to that injured individual, which may mean the bank robbery suspect gets away, but that's the way the guys are trained to do it. Um, once they get that done, they want to secure the scene, any evidence, obtain and relay any suspect information, uh, locate and interview all the witnesses and victims, um, and then document the facts, because that, that becomes very important. Um, it may be 9, 10, 12 months before these cases go forward. So that's where the officers want to go. Um, what can you expect if you report a crime? If there is sufficient evidence, we will assign an investigator, okay? And that investigator will be known to you. Often it's the uniform officer who, who comes to the scene and comes to your home. Um, the investigator should get back with the, our, our citizens, let them know the status of the case. Um, this may include whether or not arrest has been made, if the case is closed, if we're just at a dead end, we may close it, but we should be able to explain that to any citizen. 
Uh, we should be able to provide you with information from a victim advocate when appropriate. Uh, Ms. Ricks is here going to go over those things, uh, but there's clearly certain crimes where you've been assaulted, domestic situations, assaults, where we will put the victim of the crime in touch with the victim advocate. And that way they're better off at, at knowing what resources are there, uh, staying in contact with the courts, making sure everybody's getting to all the appointments and everything they need. Um, some of the things that we may not do, uh, the investigator may not share some or all the evidence or statements with you. Um, and part of that is, say we get um, a statement from a neighbor who says that uh, the guy across the street was seen in your yard and we're investigating a burglary. That doesn't mean the guy across the street is our suspect. And so there are times that we may not be an open book. There's a lot of things that we have that are very, very much public information. And when the investigation is closed, it's all public information. But there may be reasons that we don't want all this information out in the media. We may not want to release what caliber of gun was used for things like this, because later on, we may get a confession where somebody says, I did that, I shot that person. And one of the first things we're going to ask him, okay, what kind of gun did you shoot him with? And if he knows the, the correct caliber, he's probably a suspect. But we have people that every now and then will come forward and claim responsibility for crimes they did not commit. And so cops tend to not want <coughs> everything they do, especially on high profile cases, out in the public and out where, where everybody can examine them and then maybe come back and claim. Uh, and the other thing, if you are a victim at any point, if you don't think things are going right or you have questions why something is done, you have the right to come in and talk to a supervisor or talk to me. Uh, my doors are always open. I will speak to anybody who wants to come in, try to explain it to them the best of my ability. Um, I know we sort of said, okay, what, what can we do to assist females bottom line is the law itself does not distinguish. Um, a law that protects a female is the same law that protects a male. There is no differentiation in the law. Um, now there are certain points of law and when you get into harassment and stalking and all this kind of stuff that clearly protects us from other individuals and I can get into that a little more if you'd like but I'll still go through with the overview. So um, one of the things I wanted to sort of address is but what can you do to sort of be safe at home? And the point of this is not to make anybody paranoid. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to be employed here in a village that has a very low crime rate. Uh, we've got a lot of good people. We, most people know their neighbors and all these things are great. So I'm in no way trying to put out there that anybody needs to be paranoid. But I do think you need to be conscious and aware. Um, I would suggest that most people make sure your door locks. You know, make sure your windows lock. Make sure they're not easily forced open. Um, keep shrubbery and plants and things like that away from points of entry. If you've got a big shrub in front of a window and if someone wanted to break in, that's going to be their point of entry. So you can avoid that. Lighting is a great thing. Uh, the best thing on here, and again, this village is great at it, is to know your neighbors. You know. Most of us have certain habits. We have people with our kids go to dance at certain times in the evening. They play basketball, and the neighbors know that. And if they're watching out, and they know that I'm running to pick my daughter up at dance at 7 o'clock every night, and at 7.05 there's a strange car in my driveway, I would want them to call the police person. I mean, I realize not everyone feels that way, and everyone's entitled to their belief, but if you know your neighbors, if you know what's strange and what isn't, that is extremely helpful. Um, I suggest you call the police if you're unsure. Just because we respond out, there may be a 100% legitimate reason that individual is there, and that individual may be a little offended that we approached them. It is the police take that I would much rather do that than come back an hour later and take a burglary report from your home. Um, you know, we'll be apologetic, but and, and some people do get offended by that. But if somebody calls us, we're going to respond, whether that be for a barking dog at 2 in the morning or someone they just feel it doesn't look right on a certain street. 
Our job is not to question the motives of those individuals. Our job is to go out there, and if they have a legitimate reason, we say, hey, thanks for your cooperation, have a great day, and walk on by. So, um, and, and again, everyone has to do what's right for them. I'm not telling anybody how to do things, but from the police perspective, we believe this is a good way. Um, additional things when you're at home, be aware of anybody that, any stranger, anyone you don't know that comes into your house. Uh, a lot of burglaries and stuff are done by contractors, people who know someone who's been in your home. It is a very, very intimidating thing if you think about it, to go into a home where you don't know a soul, don't they have a dog, don't know if those individuals are armed, don't know if there's anything in that home worth having. To just blatantly go in and break into that home is, is a very, very psychologically tough thing to do. In my experience, most of the time when you catch a burglar, it is somebody who is somewhat aware of what's in that home, what the security features are in that home, who's around, who isn't. Um, and a lot of times, those are the people that come in to clean your carpet, and the guy who owns the carpet company is probably a great guy, but he's got some people working for him that maybe aren't, or maybe they have, you know, maybe they're willing to tell friends. You see it often in the news, home health care. And usually it's not the home health care worker, but a lot of times it's that individual who's friends with home health care worker. Um, you know, uh, watch what you lay out. Watch how much jewelry you leave laying around, credit cards laying out, checkbooks. Uh, somebody can come in and get your bank uh, account number, routing number, and do a lot of damage. So try to be aware of those things, and, and, and it helps you to avoid it. Um, I usually I had, a, I had a big old sheepdog. It's a sheepdog lab mix. Um, it wouldn't bark. It'd walk up to you and wag its tail. And I don't know how many people I convinced that dog, if I wasn't around, would bite them. <laughs> I don't believe that's true. But it was a 50-pound dog, and I don't think they ever wanted to find out. Um, so, you know, I always avoided telling people, yeah, I'm going on vacation next week. We're getting the carpet clean now. It's just you're, eventually you will find somebody who is not of a good nature is going to take advantage of that. So I suggest that you try to limit those things. Don't discuss whether or not you have an alarm system. Or, oh yeah, there's stickers on the windows. But the alarm system hasn't worked for years. That's, that's really bad things to do. Let people believe it's, it's there, even if it's not. Um, again, I'm not trying to make anyone paranoid, but I do want you to be aware. Um, when you're out walking around, you know, avoid bad spots. Avoid dark, isolated places. Walk with a friend. Uh, if you're somewhere and somebody you don't know comes up, don't open your car door. If you roll your window, if anything just barely crack your window. You don't need to have it all the way down to talk to them. Um, park in well-lit areas. Know where your car's parked. And it's very easy to do when you see it all the time in large parking lot. People come out and they're like, now where did I park? And, and when you're sort of oblivious to things and focusing on that car, you become more of a target. Um, people who commit crimes for a living, you know, everybody, I say everybody, there are people who go through and they do dumb things and, and get convicted of a crime. The people that make career criminals tend to be very good at reading people, understanding when they're intimidating people, understanding when that individual is oblivious to their surroundings. And they target those kind of people. Um, so be aware, be aware of your situational awareness. Don't ignore your gut. If you see somebody and they're looking strange, People want to sort of look down and keep to themselves. Don't stare them down. Don't get in a confrontational, but take a good look at that individual. Because if you take a good look at that individual, they're going to think, if I do something, he might remember me. And if you just keep your head focused, you're likely for that not to happen. Um, worked patrol up in Harrison Township for quite a while. And uh, we got a call one night, uh, elderly woman, close to her 80s. And she lived alone. Um, and we get there, this guy broke into her house and was actually eating stuff out of her fridge when she came outside. And he grabbed a jar from the fridge and hit her upside the head and fled the house. And I, I felt so sorry for her. Number one, she had you know, a bit of a cut and a huge goose egg over her eye. Um, 
but she had said that you know she heard somebody knock on the door but no one ever visits her that late so she just stayed in her room and then he went to the guest room and knocked on the window she heard him knock on the window and so she just stayed in her room she didn't want to turn the light on then he knocked on her bedroom window this individual had went around the house knocking at every window he did not want to break into a house with somebody in there he wanted to break into a house with no one in there if she had turned the, the lights on, there's a likelihood that individual was like, oh, and ran away. Instead, she hoped he'd go away and didn't. So there's that point of, you know, being aware, but we, we also don't want to be so oblivious and hope they go away. The police officers are there 24 seven. We have them on, call us. It's much easier, you know, if you've got something and something doesn't sound right and you've got somebody outside, turn your lights on. If they're out parked in front of your house, I'll let you make the calls to whether or not you physically look out or not, but turn a light on. Let them know that you're up and you see them there. If they legitimately have a, a car problem, they're going to be there. We're going to get there and give them help and get them on their way. If they're testing to see whether or not someone's home, they're going to they're gonna leave on their own. So. Um, the rest of all this, and I don't want to take too long, I actually sort of spell out specific offenses in case people have questions, but I've probably been going at like 25, 27 minutes now, so I'll let Wendy speak, and then if you have questions, we'll hand some questions. Sure. That sounds great. Um, what, what I want to uh, really discuss here today is, is women and safety and what happens, what are the options as a woman if you if a crime has been committed against you and kind of the procedures that will take place in the criminal justice system. Chief Hale has touched on um, just about everything leading up to <coughs> someone making a police report that an offense has been committed against them. And he also touched upon the fact that certain crimes uh, will have assistance through a victim advocate or the victim assistance program. That uh, is a law, constitutional amendment that was passed in Ohio because when a crime is committed and they file the police file charges, that becomes automatically the state's case. It is the state against John Smith, and that crime victim essentially becomes a witness. Uh, whereas you feel that it's, that it's absolutely the truth that the crime is committed against you, you, from that point on, do not have control over the case. Um, it is true that once any criminal offense is filed in a court of law, it's automatically the state's case. At that point, the person that brought the charges or that filed that complaint, they do not have the ability to drop charges or change them on their own. Um, that decision will always be made by the prosecutor, who is the attorney that is uh, hired to represent the state and prosecute people that have been accused of committing crimes. And if anyone has any questions through all this, please let me know. It's a little bit detail-oriented, but there are so many misconceptions, I think, out there about how things happen in the court system that I want to provide enough detail so that it makes sense, but not too much to be overwhelming. Um, the Ohio uh, Constitutional Amendment for Victims of Crime basically ensures that crime victims have certain rights in the criminal justice system and that decisions should not be made in any case without consulting and getting the input of the victim of crime for that case. What the Ohio law did was they uh, have specified certain types of crimes that the victim will have those rights um, in the court system. And those are typically violent misdemeanor offenses or felony offenses. And also there are some traffic offenses that may have an accident or an OBI charge that, that an accident was a part of. Uh, some of those other charges also, crime victims have rights for those cases. What we do um, through the Victim Assistance Program, our program is through the Zenia Municipal Court, 
and we represent uh, victims of violent misdemeanor crime in that jurisdiction, which includes the village of Yellow Springs, but also any other jurisdiction that would come into the Xenia Municipal Court. Xenia, Bellbrook, Sugar Creek Township, uh, the outlying areas that might be handled by the Green County Sheriff's Department. I know I'm missing some, Jamestown, Cedarville, all the universities. And we provide services to that crime victim from the time the offense happens, if the police contact us, through the very end of the case and then sometimes beyond. And what our role is, because this is a completely overwhelming process, to step by step help people through that process and provide uh, information about getting protection, about uh, asserting their rights, crime victims compensation program, which is a state program, um, receiving notification if somebody's still incarcerated, and notifications of all the court dates and times. So our goal is to make sure that anybody that has unfortunately become a victim of crime will have somebody there throughout the whole process to help explain things and, and ease the process as much as possible. In our county, we also have the Fairborn Beaver Creek, uh, the Fairborn Municipal Court, and there is a victim advocacy program through that prosecutor's office that deals or handles those crimes in that court. We, those two programs are misdemeanor level cases. Then you have a whole other section of cases that will be filed as a felony, then that places them in the Green County Court of Common Pleas with a different prosecutor's office, the Green County Prosecutor's Office. There's also a victim witness program in that court through that prosecutor's office. So anywhere in Green County, there is a program available to help victims of crime. When we're talking about women's safety, and although I work in the criminal justice system, there are many ways to obtain protection, to um, change you know, your life in, in a sense that you feel a little bit more control over your own personal safety. And there's other ways beyond filing criminal charges and involving the police department um, to go about trying to make yourself safe. There is uh, several types of, I'm sorry, there are several types of protection orders that you can apply for that you do not have to have criminal charges in order to get. There's a civil justice system, which is anything that would happen not involving a crime, but maybe someone would file a lawsuit against somebody because they've done something uh, that they believe they need reparations from. And there are different avenues to try to get that protection beyond the criminal justice system, which we can talk about all of those. Um, the protection order, most people believe that it's called a restraining order. That's actually not accurate. There are protection orders uh, for the state of Ohio. Some of them are filed and can be requested through a criminal court case. Uh, therefore, if the police department comes out and they issue a charge, they make an arrest or cite somebody in the court, there's a list of charges that you have the right to request a protection order on. There are no additional courts to go to. That's something that typically the victim advocate uh, will help you to access. There's also in the civil court, which is through the civil court of common pleas here in Green County, the ability to request protection orders on domestic violence situations, stalking situations, and sexually oriented offenses. So if you have become a victim of crime, but for whatever reason, there could be many, criminal charges have not been filed, you can still request a protection order through the Green County Court of Common Pleas. And that is a right in the state of Ohio, but also very accessible to anybody. It does not cost any money to do that. And you do not have to have an attorney to file for those orders. So you have the avenue of reporting a crime to law enforcement and, and, gaining a, and trying to gain your safety that way. You can file for a civil protection order for some of those situations without going through the criminal court system, or you can always file a civil case against someone as well. I have information about all of these here. <coughs> but I think most importantly is personal safety. And I think the more information that women have, uh, 
Um, and these crimes are for men and women. <coughs> but we know that, that women are the majority of the victims of sexual assault. They're the majority of the rape cases that are filed as they're the victims. So we know that this particular problem in our society with violent, violence against women and children, that could be sexual and or domestic violence, is, is something that we are taking seriously but need to really try to eradicate. While that's not going to happen probably in our lifetimes, there are steps that we can take to empower ourselves not to become victims of crime. Um, and the awareness that Chief Hale mentioned is a big part of personal safety. Also, listening to, listening to what your gut is telling you. Because your gut pretty much is not going to steer you the wrong way. May not make any sense to you. May not make sense logically that you feel that there's a problem here. But that is what you feel, and that, that should be honored because 99% of the time that's going to keep you safe. Um, there are many different um, programs out there currently that people are providing trainings for, but also attending, particularly in the school systems, um, <coughs> for what to do in a mass shooting situation. Some of those same principles, I think, are important for anybody that's a victim of crime, because there are ways that we can learn to empower ourselves and not become sitting ducks, per se. So for example, the ALICE training that the school systems went under, went under our city employees through the city of Zika also had the ALICE training. Because in any function, someone could walk in and we then have information about how we can protect ourselves and rather than sitting in a corner. Those principles can be applied broadly in, in our situations. We don't want to feel unsafe every time we walk out of the house. But I think in learning and, and educating ourselves on things that we can do, that fear, for me, seems to slip away a little bit because I feel I know that I have that knowledge and I do not feel as, um, I, I don't even know the word, I don't feel as worried going out because I know I have options A, B, C, and D that I'm aware of that can help and that I can use to maintain my own personal safety. So in a very broad way, these are the things that are available to us. Um, I know, however, that the wheels of justice turn slowly at times and many people have questions and concerns about how it works and how it's working for victims of crime. So I guess I would be available to answer any more specific questions that people would have. I think one of the points that you had made before that I thought was important is that um, when you call the police about a situation, you are not necessarily filing a report. So you have to be clear in saying, I want to file a report on this, or I want a, a case number, or something along those lines. I think sometimes people think because they called in and they complained about a situation that it's now um, on some type of record, and I don't think it necessarily it, is. It that was my, my main question to you, because um, first of all, I want to know if a person actually files a report, even if it's just an incident report, does it create more paperwork, more work for the officer or the dispatcher? Um, and are people being told when they call and complain about something, are they being encouraged to file these reports or just uh, shuffled off, okay, you, you called and I tell you this and now I'm done with you? Um, are people actually told, hey, you know, we should file a report about this, just calling me is not, is it explained to people is what I'm asking because I know in our meeting that we had a couple of months ago it was stated that some of these incidents when people have been in town harassing women and women calling and complaining, well then when it gets to the point where there's tons of women calling and complaining, it's like well nobody's filed an actual report yet. Are people actually being told, hey if you really want to make this a complaint you've got to file a report or are they just listened to you and then said, okay, we'll see what we can do and then shuffled off. First of all, 
what I tried to express back in the other meeting was that there were several people complaining but not complaining to the police department. Until this hits Facebook, I'm unaware of some of these things that are happening. Nobody's calling the police complaint. That is my complaint. Um, that when every now and then there's been a couple instances where um, an individual or two is predominantly bullying, taking advantage of people's good nature, and things get riled up on Facebook before the police department hears about it. So our dispatchers are not trying to blow anyone off. There is not that much work. This is what we get paid to do. We predominantly triage things. If we've got a bank robbery, a, an auto crash, and a, uh, a car window broke out, and I got two officers on, we'll handle it just like we would a hospital. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna address the, the, the things that's bleeding the most, get, stop it from bleeding, then go to the next, and then deal with it. Um, so my concern is more that, that I think people don't want to be the bad guy and are not calling the police, and then we're catching wind of complaints through Facebook and social media of things that are happening, and we have no documentation whatsoever. Whenever you call the police, you can ask a question, et cetera, but if you want a response, there is a record. Um, you know, number one, it's recorded, that's public information. Number two, if we send a car, it's put in the dispatch system, that's public information. That in itself is not a report. If an officer goes to your home, um, we're gonna tell you, you know, this is what you've got, you know, this, this is, um, I had, had a lady come in a couple days ago, she stopped in, and it appears somebody um, cut her tires in front of Tom's. So and I told her, I said, look, you know, if you got anybody's mad at you, anybody think this may have, may have caused this, you feed with anybody, um, you know, all, all the possible scenarios, she said, no, 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 no. I said, okay, well, I'll take a report. Um, I'll double check, see if there's any cameras that might have caught this. But if there's not a camera and a witness doesn't come forward and say, hey, I think I saw somebody who did it, it's what's known as dead paper. And there's not anything more for me to follow. There are no fingerprints. There's no latent evidence to gather. Um, but it's documented. There is a report. And so if somebody comes in later and says, hey, I saw you on TV talking about HRC, and I think I know the individual that did that, then we will follow that up. If we get that suspect, we'll interview them. I'll get back with my victim and say, this is who we believe did it. I've got a witness who saw him do this, or I got a confession. At that point, the witness may say, you know what, that is, I don't, I don't want to pursue it. They have, again, we're not going to push that into court at this point. Wendy is absolutely, when the court gets a hold of it, the state of Ohio becomes a victim, and in any violent crime, um, the state is going to want to prosecute that to the best of their ability. But my experience is, if it's a criminal damaging, a criminal trespassing, a telephone communications harassment, you're, you're dating an individual, the two of you break up, you're, you're getting bad text messages, we take the report, we get the individual, we get the suspect, we send it to court, the two of you make up and say, I don't want to pursue charges anymore. The prosecutors and go, okay, not a problem, and drop the charge. So um, those things happen, but you know what? It, it is not work. It is not a problem. You're not creating work for us. That's what we're here to do. Um, and and I, you know, if I come out on something that is totally civil in nature, I'm going to tell you, that, you know, yeah, the neighbor's cutting grass and the lawnmower's blowing up, a, 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 burning a lot of oil and the smoke is drifting into your house and you're upset over it, that's not a criminal offense. There's nothing much I can do. So that is what we, if you were insistent that you wanted it documented, we would do an incident report documenting your allegation. But there is no criminal violation or there's no real follow-up. But if some reason later on you want a copy of that, it's yours. So does that answer, I know you had about a three-pronged question. Well, I'm just kind of wondering if people are told when they call, well, this is not really an official report, would you like to file a report? If, would you if, like to make this an official complaint? Well, yeah. Normally, if somebody calls, we will send an officer. I mean, I, I, again, you know, it's, 
I don't want my dispatcher saying, um, yeah, just because this lawnmower's got too much smoke, we're not sending a cop. That's not going to be the case. We will send an officer. Okay? There's no criminal violation act. We'll send an officer. Number one, talk to you, explain it to you. Number two, talk to your neighbor. See if maybe they can, you know, mediate this to some degree. And if we can't mediate it, maybe guide you toward village mediation. I mean, you know, often our role is to go out there as the peacekeeper and the mediator more so than, than the crime fighter. We do a lot more of that. Um, but, you know, if you're calling and telling me, yeah, that my windows broke out of my car, there'll be an offense report. We will tell you what evidence is there, if there is any, and we'll probably tell you the likelihood of, of following this up. You know, um, you know, normally they'll go over, knock on a couple neighbors' doors, see if anybody heard anything. If we've got nothing more than that, there's a rock and you can't get prints from a rock. It, it's, it's dead paper, but it's there. Someone comes up later and, you know, says, ha ha, I broke your window up last year. It's, it's still documented. Now you've got a confession. We may be able to move and, and, and prosecute it, so. One of the things that, that I'm only aware of is, um, you know, discussions really get going on Facebook about things that people are upset about that do, that would seem to involve um, a criminal activity, and it just seems like it behooves us if we are involved in that conversation to say, "Have you contacted the police department?" Because I, I really think there's just not—I think there's an ignorance about that, and I, I mean, don't mean that pejoratively, but people just don't know. They don't know that that's what, that, what that they can do that. Well, and, and so and this is kind of an effort tonight to provide that that information that. Um, if you're upset about something that's happened, which may or not may or may not have criminal um, activities involved in it, it behooves you to contact the police department. Well, how do you protect the victim? Because we're a very small town, and oftentimes people they don't want to be in the newspaper. So their whole thing is, I'm not. I don't want to be in the newspaper. So wait, well, that that's also a a, um, a, a point of. Uh, just not knowing, um, which I kind of, when we were together before uh, over at the fire department, I spoke as a person who works at the news, um, and, and I couldn't remember a time when we did that, and that maybe no one has ever called. Can you put a name or something? <coughs> um, did I say something? Yeah. Hi, I'm Diane Shaver from Los Angeles. We don't ever put victims names in the paper. People may not know that. Well, and that was kind of my second question, too, is kind of hooked up to that, because um, I've heard lately from several people who have said that a person in town who is currently under some kind of investigation is outright harassing people that would be that person's victims, essentially, but not in a way that they could actually call the police and say, this person is physically hurting me, but with intimidation tactics, um, innuendos, subtle subtle ways. So what does a person do in that situation? Call, call the police? Because like I mean, you said before, you know, the wheels of justice turn very slowly. But if, for instance, I go into the gulch and someone is there who has been, bought, you know, been harassing and harming me, and that person, when I come in, is giving me nasty looks and starts saying things in a general direction that I know are aimed at me, but really the police are going to say, well, we can't do anything about that. that so, so what do that, does that person do to, to protect themselves from further, e emotional harm is just as, as damaging as physical harm. What do they do in that situation? Again, I would suggest calling the police. If we throw out a generic scenario, what's going to happen is people are going to judge their actions based on it. I, I don't know. I can come up with some scenario where it would not be provable that that's intimidation. But I can come up with 10 scenarios where it may be. You know, um, clearly it, it is a small place. And yes, we have victims who will run into their to uh, offenders or alleged offenders. Um, you know, to some degree, uh, that individual still has the right to be there. Uh, a look is not going to be sufficient to constitute a crime. 
And so what we're going to do is probably suggest the victim leave. We're going to can't make the victim leave, can't make the alleged offender leave, but we're going to do that. But I would much rather call and send an officer and make that decision based on the circumstances at that point than lead someone to believe, well, don't call the police, they can't do anything. Chief, I'd like to also point out, Chrissy, that if, if someone in that instance does call the police, even if there is no report taken, if the officer gets there and, and looks at the situation and says, well, there's not really an offense here, but you still have the documentation of the call itself. And if that pattern continues and it happens over and over again, then the pattern that gets established, it creates a little bit of a different scenario for the chief and his officers, right, chief? Yeah, clearly I would say yes. If you have a, a one instance, but every weekend, uh, the victim goes somewhere else and every weekend the offender is there doing the same thing that documentation would be taken to the prosecutor the prosecutor would make the determination as whether or not that's intimidation of, of a crime victim or not so that's but we would we'd be happy to present that and, and so that, it really comes into play especially since you admittedly yourself said that it the wheels of justice turn slowly okay. sometimes it yeah. takes a long time to get a criminal to have to answer to a court of law. And in the meantime, if this is a small town, a lot of interactions are um, the same people over and over again. And so during this long time period of waiting for something to actually happen, the offender is out there being allowed the opportunity to further well, harass well, their but victim. One, one of the things that it didn't come in play in this situation, but are your temporary protection orders or protection orders. Because what a protection order would say is if that victim walks into an establishment and the offender is there, that offender has to leave. That, you, honestly, I, I, because I've read it to, I don't know how many people when I was a sergeant in the jail, but the bottom line is if you're shopping at Kroger's and you got a, a bass cart full of ice cream and the, and the victim walks in, your job is to leave that Ask of ice cream and leave the store. And if you don't, you're in violation of the protection order. And that's what the protection orders are there for. Uh, and that is why it's important often for the, for the victims to obtain those. But, but it is important for them to call the, call the police and let there at least be documented record of the call. And then if that pattern is established, like Chief said, it can go to the prosecutor to look at intimidation charges. And you can also ask the police to do more yeah. driving by your house. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Our town is so little, though. It's like even if you don't use the name of the paper, most people are going to figure out who it is. Yes. You know, if you said a certain area or a certain street, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, it is, I don't believe there's any wrongdoing on the paper, and it, it is public information. Right. Yes, I no, do I'm believe there is that. with some people a stigma of, I don't want to call because I don't want my address. Right. You know, right. Um, and and. You know, uh, again, you could always come in and talk to us, in which case then the call goes in as 100 date district. Um, you know, if 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 you want to if you want to meet at Ellis Park, I'll send an officer to talk to you at Ellis Park. If you want to meet at Peaches, we'll send an officer to Peaches. We have government gas in a car. We we will go. Well, I think that's important. Do. I mean, I think that's important because I think a lot of victims don't call because of that. I mean, it's a it's a little down. It's gossipy. We know everything yes. about each other. There, there's to every coin there's, there's there's two sides and there's great advantages in this community and with those great advantages come sometimes come some disadvantages and, and being small and knowing everyone and being sort of uh, you know running the opportunity to run into everybody has those disadvantages when you're a victim of a crime. The other thing is if you if you feel that you're being harassed um, the Aside from getting and filing for your own protection order outside of the court system, there's no other way for the police to find out about this situation without you initiating that report to the police. If that report is not something the police feel that is a crime in and of itself, um, that documentation, as, as they have said, will um, possibly start to create a pattern. Intimidation of a crime victim or witnesses on charge, so is stalking. And stalking, you know, from from my experience of what has been filed in court, and the law says two or more incidences in a short period of time, 
um, that cause mental distress or fear of, of physical harm. So if, if you look at that the way the law reads uh, very specifically, two or more incidences means two or more typically reports and or two or more incidences that can be proven that you then report to the police. Um, but without that initiation, the police department is not going to know and the person still stays isolated and that becomes, you know, that contributes to the fear. You don't feel that you have any recourse or help. Even if the police cannot make an arrest, that is not a waste of time for either the police department or the person that's reporting it. Because it's a paper trail. It's a sense. paper trail. Something and happened later. Correct. And and all of these officers know um, what well, how the laws read and there's always going to be some form of education there too to explain, you know, why this may not be chargeable at this point. But and then what to do in the future. So I do have a lot of information about stalking and all these types of protection orders out here, it's frustrating because maybe those individual situations can't be charged based upon just the one situation. But that doesn't mean that you can't get the assistance and it may not turn into something later on. We hope not, but if it does, you know, I think yeah. reporting it first is, is the best mm -hmm. option at that point. I, I see myself as a fairly experienced cop, and there are certain things that clearly I can come in and say this constitutes this crime. No problem with taking the prosecutor's office, etc. There's other things I can look at and go, mm, clearly this is not a crime. But it is my belief, and the police department, as long as I'm in charge of it, if there's anything in the gray area, we will document it. We'll get a prosecutor's opinion on it. Um, early on, Chrissy had, had a question when I first got here. Some election. Well, I don't know. I, I document it. I do up the report. I do my research. I send it to a prosecutor. The prosecutor issued an opinion on to whether or not that is a crime. We're not, if it's in the gray area, my guys are going to take a report and we're going to march down to the prosecutor and get it and get it explained. And sometimes the prosecutor will go, hmm, you know what? If you get some more work, you need this and this. If you can determine that these two elements of the crime occurred, then this charge is good, but without it. So he may give us homework, and we may have to come back, and we may have to find other witnesses, find other things, find other documentation. But that's what we get paid to do. Um, so, you know, if, it, if we're not sure, call. Again, you're not bothering us. This is what the guys get paid to do. Um, you know, and we're normally not overwhelmed uh, and I normally have two officers out, so we can normally handle things in a fairly proficient manner. They come up with a, a, a really um, a, a great way of saying uh, call the police, make it uh, spiffier than that. If, you know, you really need to do that with stickers around. What about that? That's, a that's, shower. Really what, that's really what it comes down yeah. to. This is, this is pretty straightforward. Yeah. When in doubt, give a shout to yeah. the police. There you go. You know, we, we do take, uh, we, we have many referrals to our program when people are really just unsure of what to do in a situation. And, and I say this because there are three programs here in Greene County. And if someone hasn't called the police with questions about, but you have questions about protection orders, we take those calls all the time. If we don't know the answers, we're going to refer somebody to where they need to be. Um, there's so many places that are willing to help, want to help, want to be there to try and ease um, situations for people that um, I think it's really important for the public to know that, okay, if you haven't made that report, um, but you still have questions about other things, call. We will be more than happy to help uh, and provide information. And I'm going to leave so much of this information here for people to come in and take if they want. Um, but our program uh, phone number is 376-7283. And, um, you know, I think that between the agencies that are already here, <coughs> with the victims of crime, the police department, the prosecutor's office, victim advocacy programs, and the health community, um, 
I, I do believe that there is something for anyone that has a concern. It's just getting the information out to people um, to come to us. And, but that is what we want. 